Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Lots of ways to invest in real estate. This week, we're going to focus on agricultural real estate around the world. It's a big world with lots of crops and ways you can profit. That's what we'll discuss today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. If you love real estate and have always wanted to own your own business, listen up. The Real Estate Guys and their panel of experts want to teach you how to go full-time fast in the real estate syndication business. These next few years may go down in history as one of the best times ever to acquire investment real estate. There are deals everywhere if you know where to look and how to assemble the resources. The Secrets of Successful Syndication Seminar will show you how to make big money doing big deals from a team of experts that have syndicated projects totaling more than $1 billion. Don't wait for someone to give you a raise or create a job for you. Attend the secrets of successful syndication and learn how to build a team, raise capital, find deals, and make full-time money in six months or less. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. All the big players use syndication as a way to diversify risk, optimize profits, and earn big money. You can too. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio show. I'm your host, Robert Helms. With me, as usual, co-host financial strategist, Russell Gray. Hey, Robert. Still reeling from the 17th Annual Investors Summit at Sea. Oh, my goodness, what an overwhelming amount of great information and hanging out with cool people. Oh, it's amazing. It's like speed dating for just meeting a lot of the right kind of people and getting into deep meaningful relationships, you can just learn a lot. And it's not just the your summiteers, what we call the summiteers, the people that come in from all over the world, successful entrepreneurs, successful investors, people that have a built up a degree of money and wealth and are looking to go to the next level, people that are intensely curious and they study their niches. Uh, they just bring so much vibrancy to the event and you get a chance to get in these conversations. And of course, we have an all-star faculty and they're talking about things going on in the world at the macro level. And then you've got what's going on at the micro level. And you kind of put those two together and say, how can I take these big trends, things that are going on in the world and apply them into my portfolio, into my behavior, into my business to position myself either to capitalize on an opportunity or mitigate a potential loss. And you walk away from an event 10 days like that with just so many ideas, so many relationships. It can be a little overwhelming, but you certainly have a lot to work with in, in the coming year. And one of the things we talked about this year and we have for the past several years is agricultural real estate. You know, most real estate investors are used to buying a piece of property that has some sort of asset on it, a house, a commercial building, a shopping mall, something that provides income. And farmers have figured out that you can harvest from the land dollars that don't have anything to do with tenants. They have to do with crops. And of course, one of the big challenges has been it's a difficult business to get into on a small scale. I remember you and I went to a farming uh, event, actually, in uh, Iowa years ago, and it was extraordinary listening to the vendors, the practitioners, the brokers in the world of farmland talk about the size of these farms, the, the sections that people would buy, a section 640 acres. I mean, huge, big capital outlays. A lot of the listings were tens of millions of dollars to get, you know, fertile cropland. And most real estate investors are like, well, that counts me out. But in the last several years, we've seen lots of folks who have figured out a way to let mom and pop play alongside of them. And that's a really exciting development, I think, when it comes to agricultural real estate. Absolutely. You know, it's in, and it makes sense for both both sides of the equation. You know, in, in investing, especially land investing, you use the pizza theory. You know, you go buy a big, a big pizza and then you cut it into slices and you sell each slice for a little bit of a markup. And so at the end of the day, the person who brought the pizza to the party, if you will, makes a little bit of profit for their effort and everybody gets to have a slice of something they might not be able to otherwise afford on their own. It's the same concept here. Somebody go buys a big parcel of farmland, puts all the operations distribution channels in place so that you can monetize the crop and then divvies it up for a small markup to allow a lot of smaller investors to have a chance to play in that space. It's a great idea. Now, crops come in all sizes and shapes and durability and really different regions of the world have different opportunities. You know, in uh, the Middle East and in Asia, there are crops like barley and wheat and 
olives in the Southeast Asia, rice, soybeans, palm oil, sugar cane. If you look at Africa, they tend to grow yams and cassava and lentils and plantains. Central America, of course, is citrus and bananas and coffee and all kinds of different things. North America and folks who are listening in the United States, uh, we grow a lot of grain, a lot of corn, cotton, wheat, those kinds of things. And so well, California grows a lot of cannabis. Yeah, they do. And and grapes for <laughs> it's wine. An agricultural. It's probably one of the hottest agricultural crops going right now. Oh, absolutely it is. And that's the point. Different places are well suited for different types of crops. You know, for years, the great wine regions of France and California and places that, that have uh, grown wine. Australia and Argentina and Chile. So it's very geographic in that way. But we often talk about how in real estate, you have to get the market right. If you buy an investment property in a market that is incorrect, that you didn't do your research and your due diligence and your analysis on, then you can get into trouble. But With crops, it's not exactly the same. Right. And this is one of two major reasons why we think agriculture makes a lot of sense. Uh, What you're talking about, Robert, is the idea that it doesn't really matter where the hungry mouths are. If you look at global population growth, it's all happening in the East. Uh, India has got a growing population, Indonesia, China. Th- these populations need to be fed. It doesn't matter where the food is grown. Uh, and so the best farmland is what you want to buy and then the best crops. And then the, it, the product can be shipped wherever it needs to go, especially with today's shipping technologies. So you've got that one side of it. The other side of it is just recognizing that it is a staple. It is fundamental. It's a, it meets a basic human need, just like housing. Housing is a great niche to be in because people, whether they have a job or not, still need a place to live. Now, of course, they may be consuming savings or maybe government subsidies or whatever for you to be able to collect your rent. You can't have people just living there who are unemployed, which is to your point earlier about the importance of getting the market right. But the point is, is that it's among the last thing people are going to cut. Well, you know, even further up the food chain, if you will, uh, you know, there's people are going to eat even if they don't even have a home. Yep. So if you have a to choice between eating or having a roof over your head, you're going to go for the food. So, you know, agriculture is kind of a very safe, stable place to be to capture global population growth, to be able to take advantage of, even in a pullback, a very basic and resilient crop. I mean, if you think about the evolution of economics, uh, in the beginning, hunter-gatherer, it was everybody just out there doing whatever they needed to do. The real opportunity to create a civilized society started with agriculture because when somebody could produce more food than they needed to eat, now they had something to trade with. And that's the basic concept of, of economics. If you understand agriculture and agricultural economics, you understand all of economics. And it's amazing today how many people think that uh, you can produce nothing and still have prosperity. And that that's not true. So if you want to be in the basic business of producing something uh, that is going to produce a demand and, and a profit for you, agriculture is a great place to be. Our guest today has experience in real estate first and foremost and agriculture for the last several years in Latin America. We're going to talk today about the crops and the opportunities that he sees when we come back. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Real estate investment advice right in your mailbox. Sign up for the free Real Estate Guys newsletter at realestateguysradio.com. Stop for a moment. Why are you listening to this show? Are you dreaming of a bigger, brighter financial future? More personal freedom to live life on your own terms? What if there was just one skill that could make it happen? There is. Sales. Robert Kiyosaki says every entrepreneur must be good at sales. It's true for investors too. Sales is how you attract money, people, and opportunities. Sales is the skill used to negotiate deals and lead your team. Sales skills are essential to success. The good news is it's a learnable skill. The great news is we've created a two-day interactive workshop to teach those skills to you. Make plans today to attend How to Win Funds and Influence People, Mastering the Art of Financial Selling, For dates and details, send an email to sales at realestateguysradio.com or visit realestateguysradio.com and look under events. Gain the skills you need to succeed. Email sales at realestateguysradio.com or look under the events tab at realestateguysradio.com. 
Hi, this is Garrett Sutton, Robert Kiyosaki's asset protection attorney and the author of Loopholes of Real Estate and Start Your Own Corporation. As an American or foreign-based investor in U.S. real estate, you know we are a litigious society. You know that you need to protect your real estate, paper, and bullion holdings with the right mix of LLCs and corporations. Our firm, Corporate Direct, not only forms these entities, but importantly, we properly maintain them too. If you fail to follow the corporate formalities, you can lose it all in an instant. Corporate Direct is your source for LLC protection and maintenance in all 50 states. Visit CorporateDirect.com or call 800-600-1760. Mention the Real Estate Guys for a free bonus. That's 800-600-1760 or CorporateDirect.com. We look forward to assisting you at CorporateDirect.com. Hi, this is Tom Wheelwright, best-selling author of Tax-Free Wealth, and you're listening to Real Estate Guys Radio. Welcome back to the Real Estate Guys Radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. We're talking today about opportunities in agricultural real estate around the world. It is a big old world and everyone's got to eat. Please welcome to the program, David Smith. How are you, David? I'm fine, Robert. How are you? It's good to see you. You've been uh, with us on the Summit at Sea for a couple of years. Yeah. This is the second time around for us, and we're very excited. We're yeah. very, very happy to be invited, and we appreciate that. Well, it's great to uh, get to know you guys a little better. And of course, today we're talking right up your wheelhouse, uh, agriculture investing. And you actually, for many years, have lived in Latin America. Tell us about that. Well, you know, it's been uh, quite a journey. I've, uh, I've learned a lot. I've been involved in many aspects of real estate in Latin America. I began my career just sort of by chance. I lived in Nicaragua and I happened to be one of the few Americans who could speak Spanish. Yeah. And so uh, as Nicaragua became more popular in the early 2000s with tourism and things like that, you know, eventually I had, uh, you know, North Americans walking up to me and saying, hey, you know, you live here. Can you help me find a property? Right. Okay. So this just sort of snowballed. And then a couple of years later, I had a REMAX franchise in Granada. Yeah. And that was residential real estate. We also did some uh, beachfront developments. Uh, eventually, we ended up with two uh, REMAX franchises. Okay. We had, we had one in the colonial town of Granada, and we had another one in San Juan del Sur on the beach. Okay, so uh, kind of fell into real estate that way. That's correct. And uh, and now another aspect of real estate, which I think is fascinating to a lot of real estate investors, because if you think about what we do, we buy a piece of property, it's got some improvements on it that generate cash flow, which is exactly what agriculture does. Now, last time we had Carson on the program, uh, it was last year, talking about one of the many crops, which is oranges in Paraguay. Why oranges and why Paraguay? <laughs> well, it's... Uh very similar to how I got in real estate in general. Yeah. As I, be, as I moved from Nicaragua to Panama in 09, I had a friend in Colombia that kept telling me, David, you need to diversify. You need to you know, pull some of your holdings out of residential and move into agriculture. Yeah. So after some due diligence on various projects in Panama and, and also in Colombia, I decided to, to invest in agriculture myself. Yep. And I was so in, interested in the business model. I thought, wow, this is, this is great. You know, it's a, it's a passive turnkey investment, uh, not subject to the whims of the markets and things like that. So I, I really like the security of it. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was introduced to Karsten Pfau by way of a friend, a German friend that lives in Panama, okay. who was one of the original investors with Karsten. And he said, you know, David, I think you might be interested in meeting Karsten because he has a really interesting program. Uh, however, his clientele are primarily Europeans, Germans, Austrians, Swiss. And my friend said, I think that this would be a very interesting uh, uh, business for the North American market. You could probably do some good business up there. So he introduced me to Karsten. And uh, I went down to Paraguay knowing very little about the country. Uh, it was quite impressive in, in, a, in a quiet way. You know, a bit off the radar, big farming country, big cattle country. And so Carson and I have been working together for a couple of years. And uh, our core business is oranges, as Carson spoke to you about uh, last year. 
But just recently, uh, we've opened up a, a new segment of citrus, and we're doing, on a limited basis, we're doing lemons, limes, and sweet limes. And so this is something that we're offering uh, on, on a limited basis. Uh, we don't have a lot of hectares allocated, but we're going to do probably two to 300 hectares of this. And the reason for that is because we have some special clients, uh, some out of China, and also the local market as well, because there's not a lot of citrus grown in, in Paraguay. You know, one of the things that uh, struck me when we had Carson on the program and having spent some time with him this week, of course, is just when you think of oranges and you think about the durability, it's pretty durable fruit. It, it's got a distribution area. But what surprised me the most is that he said, well, we can't even meet the demand in Paraguay, let alone try to export yet. And there was a huge demand. So I'm imagining with the other new citrus, it's kind of the same thing. It's very similar. Actually, Paraguay imports about 85% of all the citrus products consumed in the country. Wow. Uh, this also holds true for vegetables. But in the, in the case of citrus, the orange is in huge demand, yep. okay, as well as lemon and lime because these are also important ingredients in the, in the local diet. Yeah. So that's why we decided to expand our offerings because we're also taking care of the local market. Everything that we do is focused on the Paraguay market. Yeah, and I know that the market is diverse there, but at the same time, if you're importing, you guys are going to be able to save some money for the local grocers and the distribution there while being able to help create in, uh, income for investors. Yes. Well, you know, we're, we're in a fortunate position because Paraguay is the number one exporter of renewable energy in the world. So this provides us with very affordable electricity. Yeah. The labor costs are very competitive. Transportation. We can, we can offer immediate transportation of the product by way of Carson's food distribution company that he owns in Paraguay and ultimately afford any import duties. So we can compete pretty strongly as far as price and also service. Now, since there hasn't been as much citrus there, but there's a demand, what's the challenges in getting those kind of crops to grow, the soils, the water, all that kind of stuff? You would think that if there was a demand, someone would have seen it by now. Well, you know, we get that question all the time. And it comes to, down to tradition. Paraguay is traditionally a row crop producer. Okay. They're number three in the world in soybean. They're big producers of wheat, corn, chia, these types of row crops. Yep. Traditionally, they do not grow citrus. They buy the citrus from Brazil. They buy greenhouse vegetables from uh, Argentina, you see. So Karsten saw this niche and said, well, okay, there's not many people here doing this. There may be one or two plantations, but of no consequence, really. Yeah. So I'm going to do this and I can focus primarily on the market. There's plenty of water. Water is just not an issue. Yeah. Uh, Paraguay is, I believe, the second or third largest holder of sweet water in the world by way of aquifers, many rivers. In fact, the commerce of the country is done on the river. They have the third uh, largest number of river craft in the world. Wow. Yeah, so you see these, you know, when, you, when you're down there, you see these massive barges. Be, it's like the Mississippi River, yeah. essentially. You're seeing barge after barge after barge, and this is how they do their commerce. So for us, the water's not an issue, and, and you can grow in Paraguay. I think the, the total uh, amount of arable land is about 87%. Wow. So let's talk about the fact that uh, trees, especially citrus trees, do take a little while to get up to speed. What does that part look like? What's the gestation period before you're actually producing fruit? Well, we import the saplings uh, from Brazil. Okay. Okay. What we do is we determine, uh, we take land uh, uh, tests. They test the soil on what type of orange or lemon would grow best on this particular piece of land. Yep. And then they do the splicing and the grafting. In, uh, in Brazil, and we, we import them. From the time of implementation, uh, generally all citrus um, starts producing after year three. So year three and a half, year four, and they continue for up to 25 years in the case of oranges. Uh, lemons and limes a little bit less, 21, 22 years. And, and then afterwards, we cut the trees down 
and we replant again. So I think about this, David, you know, creating other crops, additional crops, where you already have distribution, you already have water, you already have land, you already have employees. That makes a ton of sense. Now let's talk about the other side of it, which is that you're figuring out how to, I would say, vertically integrate the business with this new initiative you have about greenhouses. Tell us about that. Well, the, the greenhouses uh, focus on the uh, local economy. In Paraguay, the biggest challenge to growing vegetables is the heat. Paraguay gets very hot. Yeah. And when I say very hot, I'm talking Tucson hot. Wow. And above. It can be 120, 130, 140 degrees in, in many locations. So the vegetables that are grown locally and under normal uh, farming conditions, they don't grow very well. You know, they're, they're a bit stunted in growth. They don't have that bright color. They're not succulent. And Consequently, they have, don't have a good taste. Yeah. So they sell at, a, at a quite a low price on, on the local market. Most of the vegetables that are consumed in Paraguay are imported from Argentina in the greenhouses. So I'm talking cucumbers, red peppers, yellow peppers, tomatoes. Those are the ones that have the best taste, the best look, and the highest price. Yeah. So that's what we're focusing on now, and we're going to be growing in our greenhouses those four items. So there'll be cucumbers, red peppers, yellow peppers, and tomatoes. And people ask me why those those particular vegetables. Yeah. Well, in that part of the world, almost every meal, even including breakfast in some cases, they always use peppers, onions, and tomatoes. Okay. Okay, so that's the reason why we do that. And um, what's going on right now is we're about to receive our first order of 10 greenhouses, uh, probably the end of this month or early next month. And uh, so we really want to, uh, we're going to do a good video. We're going to do a speed it up video of the construction yeah, so sure. we can send out. So we're very excited about that because uh, this is a very, very good business in, in Paraguay. And we've allocated enough land to build, well, actually we started with 40. Now with some advanced contracts that we have from some of the supermarkets and some of the other buyers in the country, we've uh, added another 10. So there will be a total of 50 greenhouses available. Uh, right now, I think we've got 16 or 18 sold, so we've got to do another order very soon. But we're very excited about this because uh, many people, uh, many followers of yours uh, that we've had communications with have said, hey, when's the greenhouse is going to be ready? And they keep asking, keep asking. Uh, and however, you know, in Latin America, you have a little bit of the manana factor. Sure. So things come in a little bit late. So finally, we're, we're very, very pleased that they're coming in. And as soon as we can get this under construction, we're going to inform everyone of that. Now, how big is a greenhouse? A greenhouse is approximately 26,000 square feet. Okay. Or a half a hectare, if you, I'm sorry, a quarter of a hectare. The land that the greenhouse sits on is a half a hectare. So okay. that's 5,000 uh, square meters or 2.4 acres. Right. The greenhouse is half that size. Okay. Because you need to have access room for trucks and maintenance and all these sort of things. So that's, that's the way the greenhouse uh, structure is laid out. So, and the model is that an individual investor can invest in a single greenhouse? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Talk about what that looks like. If I invest in a greenhouse, where do I see return? Those kinds of things. Well, the greenhouse is very popular for uh, the fact that you receive a return after 12 months of making your investment. Because it's not the same as waiting for the trees to grow and that's that correct. three years of production. There. That's correct. It's basically one season for these kinds of vegetables. That's correct. So, the, the, the timeline is once you make the investment we make the order. Now, we could have additional greenhouses on order, and it could be a lot quicker, but let's just say that you, you, you make the investment, we order the greenhouse. Uh, we figure about three months to receive the greenhouse because we have to import it from Brazil. Yep. And then it takes us about six weeks, maybe eight weeks to set everything up, do the planting, that's five months, and then you get the first harvest five months later. So you get a return at the end of 12 months of making the investment. It's a cash on cash investment. And from that time on, just every year just continues. And it increases. So uh, it's, it's a, a very, very stable business. Uh, it runs 24 seven, you know, uh, they, they plant them, they take care of them. It's organic as well. Yep. Okay. So there's a lot of care involved. 
And, uh, you know, we take a small management fee for that, and we sell the vegetables, and we believe we can offer some very good returns. Well, we'll talk about that when we come back. We're talking with David Smith about uh, agricultural opportunities in Latin America. When we come back, we'll play Real Estate Trivia next. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Live nationwide, you're listening to the Real Estate Guys. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com. Memphis is famous for being the home of the king of rock and roll, but it's also the king of cash flow. If you're looking for affordable cash flow properties, it's hard to beat Memphis. Get your portfolio rocking and more cash flowing your way by calling Terry Kerr at Mid South Home Buyers. Terry's the king of turnkey properties. Contact Terry through the resource section at realestateguysradio.com. And be sure to order Terry's tips for turnkey rental property investing report. It's free. Just send your request to turnkey at realestateguysradio.com. If you want to learn how you could potentially increase your net worth by over a million dollars and quit your job in just a few short years, listen closely for the next 60 seconds. This is Brad Sumrock, and over the past 16 years, I've helped thousands of people invest profitably in real estate, but not just any type of real estate. I specialize in helping people syndicate large apartment buildings so that they can be business owners and investors. In today's competitive environment, it's even more important than ever to leverage an experienced mentor, invest in your education, and have a team of advisors that has established relationships nationwide. And so many people right now seem to be struggling to find deals and then get them funded, but yet some rock students are thriving in today's marketplace. We've purchased nearly 7,000 units and nearly one half billion in purchase volume over the past 12 months. And with the new Trump tax laws, apartment investors are positioned now better than ever before to pay even less in taxes. To find out more, send an email to apartmentsnow at realestateguysradio.com and you'll get my recent presentation called Why Apartments Now? That's apartmentsnow at realestateguysradio.com. Hello, this is Dave Lindiger, co-founder at REMAX International. You're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the show. We're talking this week about opportunities in agricultural real estate around the world. Is there a place for you to play and how might that work so you can get in on this type of real estate investing and the long-term yields associated with it? Before we get back to interview with David Smith, it's time to play Real Estate Trivia. That's your chance to win a prize by knowing today's Real Estate Trivia question. As soon as you hear the question and think you know the answer, send your best guess to Trivia at realestateguysradio.com trivia at realestateguysradio.com you want to include your name your mailing address and the answer to the question the first person that gets it right is going to get a copy of the one thing that changed everything an awesome compilation book published by our friend kyle wilson with cool stories in it from great folks that can be yours if you know today's real estate trivia question which of course has something to do with what we're talking about today before I give you this week's question, last week on The Real Estate Guys, it was our show from the Summit at Sea, and we asked this, what is the average depth of the ocean? That's a deep question. And it's a deep answer. The uh, answer, of course, when we say the ocean, that includes all the Pacific, Atlantic, Indian, Southern, and Arctic Oceans. The average depth, 14,000 feet, are 4,267 meters, basically more than two and a half miles on average. Here's our real estate trivia question for this week. Paraguay is a landlocked country bordered by three other countries. Which ones? Which three countries border Paraguay? If you know or just want to look it up quickly, get your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Include your name, the answer to the question, and your mailing address so that if you're the winner, we can send you the one thing that changed everything. That's today's real estate trivia question. We're talking today with David Smith about agriculture and the opportunity for the individual to get involved. You know, one of the challenges, David, for people that see the need for calories and uh, can recognize there's opportunity in markets like Paraguay that can't supply enough of their own particular vegetables and fruits is that it's like, well, farming, that's a big undertaking. It's lots of land, lots of equipment, lots of you know specialized training. And what you guys are doing is giving folks who are individuals and smaller investors a chance to participate right along, which is cool. And we were talking before the break about this new greenhouse concept to get the vegetables to market sooner. Uh, what are we talking in terms of cost? What does it cost to buy a greenhouse? What kind of range of returns? Uh, what's the, the plan for someone who says, this sounds good to me? Okay, 
the cost of the greenhouse, including the land, is $320,000. U.S. U.S. Okay. And that's a pretty big building and a pretty big piece of land, and you enter into a contract for you guys to take over the management of that. That's correct. The, the investor actually owns the land, and they own the greenhouse. Yeah. Okay, so this is registered and titled in Paraguay in your name or whatever entity that, that you decide to use. Yep. Uh, it's very important to remember that the contract for the greenhouse is 10 years. Okay. So we start out in year one, we have a, a, probably a, a basic return of about 15%. Okay. And that goes up to about 22% as the greenhouse really starts functioning. It yields better as time goes by. As, and, so and we're able to, to grow more. Okay. Okay, we're able to grow more. The beauty about the greenhouses too is that we can change what we want to grow sure. depending on the market demand. This is a wonderful aspect of that. But I think it's important to remember that why is the contract for 10 years? The reason for that is after 10 years, you need to renovate certain portions of the greenhouse. Yeah. As I mentioned before, Paraguay is a very warm country. So most people, when they think of greenhouses, they think of warmth inside. This is just the opposite. Right. We have cooling generators. Yep, because it's keep, already so hot. It's so hot to keep it down. So the moving parts, such as the cooling compressors, the irrigation systems, maybe lights, a few things like that, are going to need to be replaced yeah. after 10 years. So what happens is a specialist comes in from the company in Brazil, and they, they do a study of the greenhouse, and they come up with a figure to renovate it. Yeah. Now, the, the owner is required to invest this amount of money to renovate it. Our calculation is about forty to forty-five thousand dollars will be needed to to renovate the greenhouse. After that, we will renew the contract. Okay. Okay. So this is very important for us because if the greenhouse doesn't function, that affects our returns. It affects the investors' returns. So we want to make sure that everyone's on the same page and understands that going up front. Yeah, good okay. stuff. Yeah. Now that's a little different than the investment structure that you do for the citrus. That's more of a private placement. Speak to that investment for folks that are thinking, well, I get the greenhouse thing, but I was intrigued by oranges and lemons and limes. Okay. Well, there is some similarities though. Yeah. The, the structure of these private placements is twofold. There's two components. One is a simple real estate transaction. In the case of the greenhouses, you're buying the greenhouse, you're buying the land, and that's in your name. Yep. It's the same with the orange lot. You're buying the land, that's in your name, you're buying the trees, and you're paying for crop care, and that's a part of the farming agreement. Yep. So part one is the real estate transaction, and part two is the farming agreement. So they're very similar. The only difference between the two as far as renovation and things like that, in the case of the orange investment, you will need to replant around year 24 or 25. Okay. Okay, because citrus fruit has, it's a curve of produce. And, and uh, sometimes, even in the curve, you'll have just little ups and downs. You know, sometimes the trees are really happy and sometimes they're not so happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, however, at the end of the curve, there is a marked decrease in production. And at that time, uh, the trees, because all the trees have a serial number. Okay, they're given a serial number in Brazil, and we maintain that serial number through the life of the, of the tree, because that way we're able to isolate a, each and every tree and see how much it's producing. So as you start to turn into year 23 and 24, we can isolate, okay, these trees are really dropping rapidly, so let's go ahead and order those in advance and, and put them in place. So that's, that's the main difference, is that the, the, the length of the contract, the life of the tree, and, this, and eventually the tree has to be replaced, and then you go right back into the same cycle again. Whereas in the greenhouse, you just renovate it and you keep on going. You know? Okay. Yeah. And I would imagine you probably got folks that want to diversify into those two things, fruits and vegetables. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I think that uh, many people look at the citrus investments as generational wealth. 
you're creating generational wealth for your right. children and so forth like that. On the greenhouses, it's an immediate return. You know, you think about what most investors do and they're going to buy, say, a house or apartment building. And over time, it's going to wear out. It's going to deteriorate. You're going to have to do some work. Now, it's not going to be at the end of 10 years, we're going to just renovate everything. It's going to be as the tenants move out and we need this repaired or that repaired. We're going to make a CapEx, capital expenditure improvement to make it more valuable, to do something to increase the rents. It's really the same thing. And through the process of getting the trees up and running, making sure they're there, and then uh, when they've exhausted their best use to replace them, that's maybe a bump in the road in terms of the income, but then it's right back into the cycle again. So, that's correct. You know, yeah, it creates cash flow fairly soon in a, in a lifetime of somebody, but this idea that uh, those trees will just keep going as long as you keep planting them uh, on uh, generations uh, down the line, that's pretty exciting. Yeah, and if you take care of them, it, it requires the proper crop care. Well, this is exactly why these types of investments, and we're big fans of of this thinking, uh, to divide the ownership in a smaller piece, but the management oversees a lot. So these aren't 50 greenhouses with individual managers and owners and farmers. You guys are managing the whole thing, which gives you some economies of scale I couldn't get on my own. Yes, that's why we have expert staff. We have uh, a Brazilian gentleman that works for us that does nothing but greenhouses and vegetables. He knows how to grow every kind of vegetable possible that that can be grown in a greenhouse. And then we have another gentleman from Paraguay that has done nothing but citrus all over South America. So we make sure that we have top-of-the-line staff because, you know, there's risk involved in citrus fruit. I mean, this is well known in Florida for many, many other countries as well. So it's important that you really pay attention to what's going on on the plantation. Sometimes, not often, but sometimes, uh, uh, you know, diseases will start in these kinds of trees. And when they're not really taken care of immediately, I mean, you can eradicate, you can avoid a lot of this, but you have to be on top of it. Yeah. And that's what we specialize in is having the right people, the right amount of care, because all of our employees are involved in profit sharing. All right, so this is interesting that you've got folks that are working for you and they see the bigger picture. One of the things that has plagued Latin America, not just in agriculture, but a lot of businesses, lower wages, hard to keep up with cost of living. Talk about how these folks are being able to see the bigger picture because they get to profit share. Well, what we decided to do was um, to really focus on on taking care of the trees and taking care of the greenhouses is that we are offering them bonuses based upon produce amount. Okay. It's not on, on, a, on a net profit or anything like that. We want them to reach produce production quotas. Yeah. And we feel that that's where they're going to really put that loving touch on those trees, making sure that everything's done properly and giving it that extra effort. Because if the tree's not producing... Well, you know, it kind of lowers the uh, the bonus a little bit. And uh, we feel that uh, we've been very successful uh, in hiring from the local community. Okay, we uh, the first plantation is located in La Colmena. This is about a two-hour drive outside of Sancion okay. on, on, a, on a main road. Uh, this was a village that was um, founded by some Japanese farmers who came over to uh, Paraguay after the Second World War. Wow. So a lot of the streets are, have Japanese names, and there's Japanese people living there. And as you know, they're great farmers. Yeah. Okay, so we've, we've managed to incorporate them in, into the plantation because they have a lot of expertise. They know the countryside really, really well. They know all the water sources. They just, they just know a lot. So uh, we feel that it's, it's very important to uh, you know, have a social responsibility. And, uh, and we've done other things, too. We're trying to build a school right now. Wow. In one of the villages, uh, it's, we need permission to do that. But you know, we we feel that we'll have that uh, sometime this year. We're gonna we're gonna do a small uh, primary school, uh, a little bit further out of town, where the children, you know, normally they have to commute or walk to school. Okay. And uh, you know, sometimes in bad weather they don't go, things like that. So what we're trying to do is put the school out where they are, and so that's that's been a very important uh, program for us. So what are the kinds of questions that people have? You deal with investors all the time that are maybe traditional real estate investors and they haven't delved into agriculture, but you've got their attention. What are some of the top questions people generally have or maybe things they're surprised by? Well, they're surprised by Paraguay, (laughs) I can tell you. You know, um, when I mention, oh, you you should take a look at our program in Paraguay. Well, you know, their first response is, hmm, 
Paraguay. Yeah. I've heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't hear much about it. Right. And so my response is, that's great. That's the best place to invest, yeah. a quiet place. Yeah. And, and you know, Paraguay, I'm sure uh, Carson's mentioned this to you as well. You know, it's a, it's a very um, agricultural country. Right. I mean, it's a powerhouse. Big beef exporter. I think sixth in the world in beef alone. And as I mentioned before, uh, row crops and things like that. Yep. Uh, once, once you mention these things to people, um, they become curious. You know, number one exporter of, uh, of renewable energy. I had, I had no idea about yeah. these things, you know. So uh, people are intrigued by that. Most Americans have not invested overseas. Very small percentage. Sure. I, I read one time about four or five percent of Americans invest overseas. Okay. I mean, so maybe 20 million. Yeah. 25 million, something like that. So you have to really explain uh, not only the history of the country, the history of the company. Uh, I think what helps us is the fact that Carson's been in, involved in Paraguay for 25 years. His father was involved before him. Right. That gives us a lot of credibility. And, uh, and then ultimately, uh, uh, this, this sets us aside uh, apart from other agricultural investments that I know of, is the fact that our contracts are written and subject to German law. Well, with, with his German background, it's interesting. You talk about the Japanese farmers and kind of the multicultural effect here. And, you know, one of the things that uh, I think gives Carson a lot of credibility in our crowd is that he's a real estate guy, real estate background, yeah. Germany developer. I mean, he's got to come from a real estate family. And, and early on, his dad saw this opportunity to kind of diversify. And you don't put those two things together, but you don't think there's probably a ton of German farmers in Paraguay. But then you find out, well, the Japanese are here and there's folks that are doing all kinds of oh, you know, Mennonites. Mennonites. Yeah. Yeah. Many Mennonites. Mennonites are great farmers. So uh, it sounds exciting. Now, I know I always encourage people to go out and test drive an investment to see it for themselves. And one of the things you guys do is make these trips available. Talk about how uh, that works if someone says, you know, this sounds interesting, but I want to see it. Well, we've, we've done quite a few tours, actually. Yeah. Um, we've done, uh, let's see, I've done one in November. I had one in February. In fact, the one in February was quite international. I had from the United States some Filipinos, Chinese. I had a couple of guys from Nova Scotia. Wow. And I had some Japanese investors. All came down there. Logistically, it's a, it's a challenge sometimes, I'd say. Uh, it's a long way, you yep. know, to get there. I live in Panama. So what I try to do is gather as many people as I can, because sometimes I have people saying, well, I'd like to go in May, or I'd like to go in June. I, if possible, I try to put as many people together and we go down together. Now, in the case of, uh, for example, in June, we're going to announce one with you. It's going to be like an official tour, yep. real estate guys tour and things like that. We do both kinds. We do sort of improv, you know, impromptu tours. If two or three people say, hey, I can go in June, then I try to get them all on the same day and it sure. works out well. It's more efficient. So, yeah. So what happens with that is everyone meets me in Panama. I arrange uh, the hotel for them, and then uh, the following day, we all get on a plane in the afternoon, about 3.30 in the afternoon, and we fly nonstop to Asuncion. Okay. Arriving in Asuncion just before midnight. By the time we get to the hotel, you know, it's 1.30 in the morning and so forth. Uh, the following day, uh, we take it easy, let everybody sort of relax, you know, from the travel and stuff like that, and then we usually arrange a, a, an interesting tour of Asuncion. Sometimes we do a river tour which many people have found interesting because yeah. you can actually see how the commerce is done. You can see how the, con the country functions. And then the following day, we spend all day on the tour. So we see both plantations and we also introduce them to our staff. They can meet the staff. Yep. They can see how everything works. And so that's a pretty full day. And then after that, most people will leave and go and, and head home after that. So yeah. it's, a, it's not a long tour. You know, you need basically three nights, maybe four nights, something yeah. like that. Well, hey, uh, you guys put together a really cool report. We did the Oranges report. Now there's one on Citrus. And uh, we'll tell folks I think get that in a minute. But uh, talk about what's in the report. What are they going to learn? Well, they're going to learn a lot about the demand for Citrus around the world, demand for food. They're going to learn about how we actually farm what kind, of, what kind of trees we use, the size of the plantation, and also our, our forecast in the future, what the demand's gonna be. So it's, it's a quite uh, comprehensive report. I mean, we, we try to provide as much 
historical information and worldwide information about food consumption as possible. Yeah. And they learn a little bit about Paraguay. They learn about Karsten. They learn about who we are. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's really important. Well, this sounds interesting and you want to learn more about it. Uh, we'll tell you how you can do that when we come back. Dave, this has been great stuff and uh, awesome. We get caught up and hear about the uh, citrus uh, expansion plus the greenhouses. Again, if you want more information on that, and that'll also get you Dave's contact information, we'll tell you what to do when we come back. Thanks for being on the program, Dave. It's great having you. Thank you very much, Robert. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Need help with your real estate investment portfolio? Check out the resources page at realestateguysradio.com. Hey, it's Robert Helms. Thanks so much for listening to the show today. I want to personally invite you to come see an amazing real estate market that combines excellent cash flow, offshore diversification, and what we affectionately call lifestyle investing. Come join me from July 5th to 8th in the beautiful country of Belize. The Real Estate Guys have been bringing investors to Belize for more than 13 years now, and our discovery trip is designed to show you the market like nobody else can. Sure, Belize is breathtakingly beautiful, the people are wonderful, and wait till you taste the food. But the real opportunity is the real estate investment potential. 2018 was the biggest year in tourism Belize has ever witnessed, and this year is starting off strong. How does that translate to real estate investment? That's what you have to come see. There's all types of opportunity in Belize when it comes to real estate, including both long-term and short-term rentals, commercial and retail triple net properties, business opportunities, land acquisition, development, agriculture, and more. And as the only country in Latin America with English as its official language, it's easy to understand the law. Property rights are strong and contracts are in English. And at Ambergris Key, a unique situation exists where demand for rentals continues to outstrip supply creating a compelling environment for investors. So come see for yourself. Join me July 5th through 8th in Ambergris Key, Belize, as we study the market, learn about the sustainable drivers, and tour lots of beautiful real estate. And like all of our field trips, there are no properties for sale during the weekend. Rather, you'll meet lots of local providers that will help educate you about the market so you can follow up with them after the trip if the market's interesting to you. But that ball's in your court. You'll receive their contact details, but they won't receive yours unless you give it to them. You've heard about Belize and the Real Estate Guys for all these years. Now come see what all the excitement is about. Plus, we'll have lots of time over meals and activities to talk about all things real estate. To get the details, go to the website at realestateguysradio.com and click on Events, where you'll find the Belize Discovery Trips. Once you register, you'll get information about our group hotel rates as well as travel details. So join me in Belize, July 5th through 8th. It's a beautiful country with lots of amazing possibilities, and the only thing missing is you. Go to realestateguysradio.com under events. I look forward to seeing you in beautiful Belize. Hi, this is Doug Casey, and you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning in. You know, nothing happens without somebody selling something. And if you're in the real estate business, then you need to understand influence and sales. And no better place to do that than how to win funds and influence people. It's our two-day workshop on sales, really person-to-person -person across the table selling. Great for folks that are raising money, great for folks that have a product or service and want to get it out to the world. And that happens once a year. It's coming up in June, taught by the one and only Russell Gray. So looking forward to having lots of folks out at how to win funds and influence people. You can get the details on our website at realestateguysradio.com. Today, we're talking about agricultural opportunities and uh, awesome to hear from David Smith. Yeah, you know, we talked at the beginning of the show about how on the summit at sea, you get a chance to meet so many interesting people. And it isn't just the summit, it's conferences. It's why we go to the New Orleans conference every year. Brian London does a great job putting together a room full of really interesting people. And one of the favorite things I love to do is walk around these exhibit halls and find out what people are up to, what they're doing. And, you know, we've become kind of enamored, not just of agriculture, agriculture, but of offshore real estate, because a lot of these properties don't have any leverage in them. So there's not a lot of air. If you think about what goes on in marketplaces and in product niches where there's a lot of financing, it's great because you can get those big equity pops, but that pendulum swings both ways. 
for the purpose of putting some stability into your portfolio, some privacy into your portfolio, uh, some international diversification, uh, potentially even earning income in other currencies. There's a lot of reasons to take a look at international, and then you can marry the two together with international and agriculture. Uh, one of the challenges that a lot of domestic, when you think about it from a, a United States or an American point of view, the farming industry in the United States is a little bit more challenging. Regulations, environmental issues, uh, and that isn't to say that things grown in other places are bad. You know, I, I pay a lot of attention to what I eat. And, you know, Robert, you've commented on this many times down in Belize, the idea of organic. People don't even use the word organic because generally organic is how they do it. So there's a lot of reasons why international uh, agriculture can make a lot of sense. And so the key is you got to have boots on the ground. You got to have people who know the business. Uh, it's not something you just go jump on a plane and go buy a piece of farmland and go, okay, I'm in the business. I mean, there's many, many other pieces of the puzzle. So you got to do your homework. But it starts with forming a relationship with somebody uh, who's been there, done that. And that's one of the things that's great about David, because he's a guy that's been in the space for a long time, uh, sees it, understands it, and uh, is happy to share his wisdom with people. So it was great to have him on the program. In fact, uh, David's put together a really cool report on many of the things he talked about today and some of the reasons they've chosen the crops they have. If you want a copy of that, all you have to do is send an email to citrus, citrus, C-I-T-R-U-S at realestateguysradio.com and you'll get that report and also David's contact details. They do trips to Paraguay so you can kind of kick the dirt and check out the crops and see what they're doing down there. And so for many folks, they're going to want to go see it before they buy. And uh, other folks are just like, you know, put me into the deal. But whether or not this particular opportunity is right for you, I think expanding your thinking to a bigger picture of real estate than just little houses or hotels is important. I mean, this is one of the ways that real estate has yielded for years in certain places, there's great tax advantages to it. It can be great legacy income. Many of the crops grow year after year after year, and the costs go down over time, not up. So there's a lot of things to consider. And to your point, Russ, I think coming alongside someone who knows what they're doing is critical in any real estate endeavor, but for sure when it comes to agriculture. So big thanks to David Smith for not only joining us on the summit, for sharing his time uh, today. Uh, coming up soon, it's Ask the Guys. That's your questions and our answers. If you've got a question for the Real Estate Guys, go to the website at realestateguysradio.com and just click the button that says Ask the Guys. We'll take a bunch of those questions and answer them soon on the Real Estate Guys radio program. Until next week, go out and make some equity happen. This episode of the Real Estate Guys radio show is brought to you by Paradigm Life. Powerful cash management strategies using life insurance. Learn more at beyourbank.com. Mid South Home Buyers, low cost, turnkey cash flow properties in Memphis, Tennessee. Corporate Direct, asset protection strategies for real estate investors from attorney and rich dad advisor Garrett Sutton. Find these and other great companies under the resources tab at realestateguysradio.com. To learn how you can expose your product or service to the Real Estate Guys audience, call 888-489-7723, extension 4. That's 888-489-7723, extension 4. Or use the feedback page at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Real Estate Guys radio show.